Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations, and I'm uh, thrilled to host the second edition of our partnership with LSU and the Stevenson uh, Disaster Management Institute. Um, this is a series that we put together um, really from the vision of a very uh, important and special person in this field, uh, Lori Bertman, who runs the Pennington Foundation. It was really her vision that helped us put this together. And I'd like to recognize Lori in the front row right here. Thank you for your help with this. Thank you for uh, your vision. Uh, I'd also like to recognize Joey Booth, uh, who's the director of SDMI, and Tom Anderson from SDMI, and Jameson Day, who I hadn't seen yet here from SDMI. But uh, this is a terrific partnership for CSIS because we get to work with some of the experts, people unfortunately, as we all know in Louisiana, who have had um, some very firsthand and personal experiences with disasters. And they're here, you know, their role with us is to work together, um, to learn from each other, and to hopefully advance the ball on many of these issues. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Rick Ozzie Nelson, who leads our Homeland Security program here. And uh, Ozzy is going to moderate the panel today. Ozzy. Thank you, Andrew. Well, welcome, everyone. This is a great crowd. We look, we're look. we very excited to have this many people. Hi, Neil. How are you? Um, I'm Rick Ozzy Nelson, the director of the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program. I found out this is problematic. Um, when we were doing the RSVPs for this event, this is an area when people when I started getting into disaster management and working on this issue, I um, was looking at it really from a domestic perspective. And then it went from a domestic perspective and talking to our folks at Louisiana and realizing the significance of the international component, significance of the coordination issues, and realize that domestic management it just isn't really a U.S. or a homeland security issue. It's actually a global issue. So then we, they started talking about, you know, we have to coordinate better with state and local governments and the federal governments. Well, that's kind of the easy part, and that's yesterday's news. We now have to coordinate better with our international partners. We have to coordinate better with the private sector, and we have to coordinate better with non-governmental organizations, NGOs, which I have limited experience with, actually. So when I saw the, when I was trying to get people to come to this event, we were low on the NGO RSVPs. And some one of my colleagues joked and said, that's because you have counterterrorism in your title. So, <laughs> so we were here as a Homeland Security and Disaster Management. We'll delete counterterrorism for the purposes of this uh, meeting. But I have to admit, this is a new audience for me. Um, I, I um, could not have done this without the help of my colleagues who have a tremendous amount of experience in this area, such as uh, Mark Quarterman. I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, he uh, runs our new, uh, 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 and Stacy White. Stacy, what's our new program called? Conflict? There you go. That's the opposite of counterterrorism, right? <laughs> but they were very, very helpful, as well as um, some others in, in the organization. Heather Conley, who used to work at the American Red Cross, and um, I think uh, and, and Hardin Lang, who just came back from uh, from Haiti. So thank my colleagues for for bringing this wonderful crowd together. Um, so obviously, our our you know event tonight is on international cooperation. Um, we're going to have Craig Fugate here in February, and then in March, our next event will probably be on, on public and private sector cooperation. So we're trying to get a broad brush uh, overview of some of the challenges that are facing the disaster management and preparedness and response communities. Um, obviously, you know, last, uh, last year's devastating earthquake, earthquake in Haiti highlighted the importance, once again, of international cooperation and disaster relief. Um, there was an estimated 400 uh, international organizations as well as military uh, and government entities from over 26 separate countries that, to, that rushed to provide aid. Um, for the first six months, they fed 4 million people and provided 1.5 million with emergency shelter with clean water and medical care. Despite these successes, as many of you probably know from firsthand experience, there were still struggles, there were still challenges that remain today. Um, we, had, we have challenges with the local government officials there. We still have government um, coordination between the government, NGOs, and the private sector that, that remain. And we still have, obviously, a lot of challenges there. There's still a, lot of, a million Haitians without um, um, homes, still have rubble, and we're still working on trying to get the funds that have been committed spent. These are all challenges that are way outside of my area of expertise. That's why we've invited these three distinguished people here to come speak. Um, so using that as an overview, we're gonna, uh, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to have each of our speakers speak for seven 
10 minutes, give us an overview of their thoughts. But really the benefit of this is going to be the dialogue from you all, the conversation. So when they're done, we're going to open up to questions and answers. Um, and again, it's not statements and answers. It's questions and answers. Um, and we ask that you just state your name and the organization you're from. Uh, the bios of all of our speakers are in front of you. Uh, I'll give a short uh, intro to each of them. First, uh, to, to my left here is uh, Mark Ward. He's the acting director of Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance at the uh, U.S. Agency for National Development. Uh, prior to this, um, Mark was a special advisor on the development to the head of the United Nations mission in Afghanistan. Uh, next to him, we have uh, David Meltzer. David is a senior vice president of international services for the Red Cross. David is directly responsible for the international activities of the organization, including health programs in over 30 countries, a $580 million tsunami recovery program, and disaster response activities throughout the world. And then batting cleanup will be uh, Joel Charney, and we're absolutely thrilled that Interaction is here. So Joel, thank you for coming. He's Vice President for Humanitarian Policy and Practice at Interaction, an alliance of US-based relief and development organizations. Uh, Joel has conducted humanitarian missions in Pakistan, uh, Congo, Rwanda, Chinese border with North Korea, Indonesia, Sri, -La Sri Lanka, the Central African Republic, Burma, Syria, Kenya, and Sudan. Um, so these individuals have actually an immense amount of experience and uh, uh, expertise in this area. So um, enough for me. And Mark, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you for, for comments. Thank you. Ozzie, thank you very much. David, Joel, nice to see you again. And terrific idea, CSIS and LSU, to get all of us in this town to continue to focus on the importance of being better prepared for disaster response, um, from my perspective, outside of the United States. Um, so thanks very much. You know, we'd like to think 2010 was an aberration, an exceptional year with the Haiti earthquakes and the floods in Pakistan, but I'm not sure. 2010 could be the new normal, and, and that's got us very concerned at, at USAID. And I know it's got the UN agencies very concerned that we deal with on disaster response on a daily basis. And that's why this topic is so timely. And the support from Pennington, from LSU, and others, the growing support for discussion of this topic is so important. We think we've got to grow our response capacity and integrate new actors to meet those challenges. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. To put it bluntly, we've got to change our approach and we've got to start welcoming all the help that we can get. Look at Haiti and Pakistan. My office, the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance at USAID, we responded to 70, 70 declared disasters in 2010, but obviously Haiti and Pakistan were at the top of the list. And to be frank, responding to those two disasters strained our structures and approaches, I won't say to the breaking point, but strain them significantly. Between us, all the UN agencies, all the other international organizations, the wonderful international NGOs, the local NGOs, other donor governments, we did great work. We benefited millions of people, providing emergency shelter and food and water and heading off serious uh, disease outbreaks, at least until a few months ago in Haiti. But the scale of the demand was simply too great for, all, for the international community to meet all of the needs. Not to minimize what was done. Immediately following the earthquake in Haiti, we and others mobilized search and rescue teams from USAID, from FEMA, and elsewhere that saved more than 130 people, pulling them out of the rubble. That was a record. We worked with the United Nations World Food Program to feed three and a half million people and with other partners gave basic shelter materials to another one and a half million people before the rainy season. That was a record. Up to 1.3 million people got safe drinking water. That was a record. And in Pakistan, we provided basic shelter material to between three and four million people. That was a record. But none of them was enough. We've got to expand our capacity, bring in new organizations, the private sector, businesses, philanthropy, 
private contributions, adopt and adapt to new technology, and do more to mitigate disaster response before the next disaster hits. So how do we do it? First, we need to put our own house in order in the old United States government. President Obama said, and he's right, absolutely, that we need a whole of government approach. I wasn't here, I was in Kabul on other business at the time, but I understand when the earthquake hit in Haiti, one of the first things the President said to the interagency team is, I want a whole of government response. This is so big. And that brought new expertise and resources to bear, which is great. But coordinating that effort here and in Port-au-Prince was a challenge. And the, and the QDDR, which some of you have seen, talks about the need for an international response framework to help the United States government figure out faster and more effectively when a disaster hits, who is going to have the lead within our government on coordinating that whole of government response. And we at USAID very much look forward to working on that because we can and have to act faster when the whole of government is going to be put to work on one of these mega disasters. That's on the inside. We've also got to embrace more help from outside the government. And let me start with private contributions from the public. I'm delighted that Pennington is here to, to join us in this discussion. You know, after the Haiti earthquake, there was a massive outpouring of private contributions from the diaspora, from all Americans, far more, well, we'll never know exactly how much it was, but we think far more than the United States official contribution. We saw the same thing after the tsunami. And the challenge, if we will take it, is how to coordinate those private contributions to make sure that all that money is spent well on the ground. Some private contributors, citizens, organizations, companies approach us after a disaster and ask, who should we give to? And, and we're very happy to share with them information about which international NGOs we are working with on the ground that are taking contributions, organizations that we know are doing good work, and some of them are represented here tonight. Hello, Randy. Um, to speak of one, Mercy Corps. And, and organizations that we, knew are, we know are working through the UN cluster system in that country so that their work is also coordinated with what everybody else is doing. And we've all heard horror stories of when that doesn't happen. I'll never forget, I've been in this business a long time, look at me. Um, I'll never forget that day in Sri Lanka after the tsunami when I visited the ovens. The ovens were shelter erected overnight by a very well-meaning charity who arrived with a sack full of money, bought local building materials, and erected shelter. All that was left for building materials was corrugated iron sheeting. They built ovens. And we all remember those of us that worked on the Pakistan earthquake the scene at Chakalala Airport, next to the Islamabad Airport, piled high pallets as far as you can see with, are we allowed to use colorful language at CSIS? Absolutely, you're on webcast too though. Crap. <laughs> piled high with crap that had to be buried, but took time unloading, took time on those runways and delayed the delivery of stuff that we really needed. So we have a mantra at, o at OFDA that cash is best. And after the tsunami, I had the pleasure of working with former Presidents Bush and Clinton, and they were great on spreading that message. And the, Cl the, the Clinton younger Bush um, Haiti Fund has similarly pushed the private, the, the private contributions towards cash. Um, now, we're never going to be able to coordinate all of the private money that's coming in, but I think this is an area where we have to focus more attention to get as much of it coordinated with, this, with what the real needs are on the ground as we can. I also believe that 
stuff, the opposite of cash, isn't always bad. And this is not the most popular view in my office. Sometimes equipment and commodity contributions can really help. I'll never forget working with Jeff Immelt during the Pakistan earthquake. He was one of the five CEOs that accepted the call to help us raise corporate funding for the, the Pakistan earthquake effort. And he said, I'll give you some generators. And we turned him down. Uh, we shouldn't have done that. Uh, we bought a lot of generators, and the GE generators would have been very, very welcome. So we've got to be more flexible and figure out how to talk to the major corporations that have business interests in these countries and a philanthropic spirit better. In the Haiti earthquake, there are some good stories. The Penske Corporation worked with the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund to donate 40 trucks. It was the right equipment, it was absolutely needed, and it was immediately put to work by WFP and the government. And I remember the contribution of UPS after the earthquake in Pakistan in 2005, where they donated uh, a significant amount of lift for free into the country, and they let us decide what to put on. But this is going to require a lot of discussion and a meeting of the minds between my organization and the private sector to figure out how to better communicate what we need on the ground so that this is a question of pulling what's needed and not pushing what's available. But it is one of our priorities going forward, particularly after 2010, and I'm delighted that there's an office at the State Department who can also work with this on global partnerships. I think we need to do more to take advantage of indigenous capacity in the countries where the disasters hit to increase our capacity. Pakistan, where the floods hit last year, is a great example. Civil society in Pakistan is fantastic, and the United States government knows it better than most because we helped give birth to some of it decades ago. And we have to make more of an effort in my organization to look for that capacity in country and use it when it is there, when it is reliable, when it is accountable for the funds that we give it. Now my friends in the audience that represent the international NGOs need not worry about this. I'm talking about increasing our capacity, not substituting our capacity. And what we found in Pakistan as the flood spread south, seems to me I sat right here and talked about that, as it spread down into Sindh and Baluchistan and the Punjab, we needed more capacity. We needed more NGOs. The international NGOs were saying to us, we can't spread that thin. And so the Pakistani NGOs that were available were a godsend. We need to be willing to work with them more. And I encourage, and we will continue to encourage, corporate philanthropy businesses with interests in those countries to create relationships with indigenous NGOs in those countries in between disasters so that when the next disaster hits, those business interests in the country know who they want to work with, have established those relationships, and can use them quicker and be more effective more quickly. And then my final point, which I've just hinted at, and maybe the most important one of all, that I hope everybody can get more excited about and more involved in, and that's the importance of disaster risk reduction activities. If I'm right, and sometimes I am, that 2010 is the new normal, and we do not have the capacity to respond to the disasters that are coming our way, then we have got to make the investments in between the disasters so that when they hit, they're not so big. It's, it's a challenge for us. I get a very generous budget from the United States Congress. Thank you very much. But I have to balance, we have to balance at USAID, funding for disaster response with funding for disaster risk reduction activities. Now you look like a fairly intelligent group. Where do you think the money comes from when a disaster comes along that we weren't expecting? 
and disaster risk reduction activities always seem to get left behind. So th again, we need help from outside sources of support, and I'm delighted to be able to begin that discussion, I hope, with some of the outside players here tonight. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. David? Thank you, Rick, and uh, also want to thank the center as well as LSU and the Pennington Foundation. This is a great opportunity uh, to talk to an audience that we don't normally talk to on the international disaster side of the, uh, the shop, if you will. Um, I'm going to borrow a phrase that is often used uh, in the military context where you, uh, you hear about the fog of war. Uh, the same is true in disaster, the fog of disaster. Disaster, relief, recovery, is never going to be surgical. It's never going to be clean. It's messy stuff. Um, I do think uh, there are really good ways, which I'll talk about, to, to mitigate the mess, to reduce the mess. Um, I also feel that in an international disaster, uh, there are a number of factors that make it more complicated, more difficult to do a good job than a strictly domestic disaster. And let me just talk a few, a few factors that contribute to the fog of disaster. Uh, in an international disaster, you have many more actors. You have international non-governmental organizations. You have certainly what we call the host government, Haiti, but you often have a number of other governments that for humanitarian reasons and really for political reasons have an imperative to respond. You have multilateral organizations, the United Nations, chief amongst them. Everyone will descend upon the site of the disaster with the best of intentions and will step on everyone's toes because, and this is something Mark mentioned a number of times, coordination. Coordination is really tough, um, particularly if you're not in your own country. You have language barriers. You have cultural barriers. You have the fact that you're bringing people in and there's no place for them to sleep. Really simple things that just weigh down the response and weigh down the effectiveness in the international context. So coordination is really, really difficult in an international uh, disaster. And in Haiti, it was multiplied, I would say, a thousandfold because in Haiti, and it's, you know, it's been referred to as the Republic of NGO. And what that meant in practical terms is that you had before the quake, I forget the number, how many thousands of NGOs, very good NGOs. Most of them focused on a very small community, perhaps an orphanage, perhaps a school, that do very good development work. But relief, disaster relief is a business, it's a science. And all of a sudden, these organizations were overwhelmed with need in their little communities, and they didn't have the resources to sit through the necessary but painful meetings required to undertake effective coordination. So in Haiti, we saw the great weight of NGOs um, weighing down the response in many ways. And it's not a lack of um, good intention. It's a lack of means to sit through these meetings and coordinate and make sure that that small NGO sitting next to you isn't providing assistance to the same community you are and that you're not both forgetting the community just, just down the, uh, the rutted road uh, a kilometer away. In addition to the, the many actors, um, what, what makes international disaster, I think, more difficult is um, role confusion. If we have a disaster here in our country, it may be a bit messy, more than a bit, but I think each agency has a general idea of what its role is from the federal government, state government, and yes, we certainly see conflicts, but there's opportunity uh, to plan ahead, to prepare, and to mitigate a lot of that role confusion. It's much more difficult in an international context. There isn't as much planning. There is not as much tabletop exercising on a multilateral basis. And so when an international disaster strikes and everyone comes to the table, it can be a bit of a food fight. And it can be very confusing. You have the added complication of media. In a large international disaster, 
where every, you know, many country is responding, and at least in the case of Haiti, over 100 countries responded through their local Red Cross or Red Crescent Society to Haiti. Well, the local media wants to cover that story. And so they are running around looking for their story, looking to highlight in a good way what their local government or local Red Cross or local NGO is doing to the people back home. Well, all of that creates a real opportunity for what I referred to earlier, the fog of disaster. So how do you mitigate that? How do you uh, reduce the inevitable uh, noise that accompanies an international disaster and the inevitable inefficiencies? At least within the Red Cross, Red Crescent network, and I, I don't want to hold us out as unique. There are many other organizations and governments that have similar frameworks, um, but we've been doing disasters for decades, over a century, and what we have learned, and this will come as no surprise to those of you familiar in the domestic, is understand where your competency lays. So for example, the American Red Cross in an international disaster, we do distribution of relief supplies really well. We don't do mobile field hospitals. We don't do logistics. Now I know the British Red Cross, they do logistics. The Germans and the Canadians, they have mobile field hospitals. So understand what your role is, understand what your capacity is, and understand, more importantly, what you cannot do well. And let someone else play that role. So that, at least in our little Red Cross network, we understand each other's roles and capacity. And, and I'm overstating it to make it sound like it's really clean, but we generally stay within our lanes. And that, to me, reduces some of the natural uh, waste and inefficiencies that you see when the sky is falling. Um, so I think that, that is a, a real key success factor to an international disaster as well as domestic. Understand your roles, stick to your lanes. The other thing, and, and this was also mentioned by Mark, is indigenous capacity. Um, following the Haiti disaster, we fielded, I would say, thousands of calls from well-intentioned Americans saying, I want to volunteer, I want to go to Haiti, I want to help. Bless them. It's really sincere, but please do not go to Haiti. <laughs> you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture, and we've got no place to put you. You want to sleep out under the stars with all sorts of disease and, and uh, security issues? So what what we get our legs, our feet on the ground is through the local society. There were tens of thousands of Haitians who understand the culture, understand the language, and have a place to rest their head at night, humble as it may be after the quake, and they are dying to volunteer. They really want to volunteer, and the great thing about volunteering is it helps your psychological recovery. You're now playing a role in the recovery of your community, whether it's your little neighborhood or your country, you're playing a role. So take advantage of what the local capacity, civil capacity, can afford. The other thing that I want to touch upon is um, the significant advantages, but also um, concerns in working with military authorities if you're an NGO or you're a Red Cross. Capacity is great. We saw in Pakistan in 2005 you know, the only way to get to some of these remote communities were through helicopters and military helicopters. That's great. If you have only, uh, only one way to help a community, use it. But you have to avoid creating confusion. I'm the American Red Cross. I'm not the U.S. government. I'm not the U.S. military. Part of my ability to deliver assistance is my independence and my neutrality. That gets blurred if I start flying around in U.S. military aircraft. Doesn't mean you never do it, but it means you're very careful about how you partner with military. It is very much an important partner, and we saw it in Haiti when we partnered with the U.S. Navy and they deployed the hospital naval ship, the Comfort. And the, the U.S. Navy said, can you, American Red Cross, can you train and deploy Creole-speaking volunteers to work on the ship and act as interpreters? And in four days, we trained and deployed 70 interpreters, and they did wonderful work. Um, we subjected them to all sorts of stresses and pressures by literally putting them in the OR. 
and they became the means of communicating horrible news to family members or survivors. Um, there is a way to really uh, develop a very good partnership. So that's how I think you can avoid some of the fog of disaster. But I, I just want to come back to a point that Mark made at the end, which is around preparedness and disaster risk reduction. Um, and, and not to engage in the whole debate about climate change and whether it's caused by humans or it's just happening. To me, that's not relevant in the disaster business. What is relevant is it is happening. And you can look at all the statistics which demonstrate, and there's an institute in, uh, I think, Belgium, CRED. I can't recall what the French uh, translation is, but we've got wonderful charts, if you can call it wonderful, that show the number of disasters and the damage those disasters bring are increasing at a rather steep rate. And they, they go back a couple of hundred years. And with increased population, increased urbanization, increased poverty, all that contributes to the fact that with increasing natural disasters, we will have more damage, more deaths, more vulnerability, and more insecurity. <coughs> Someone told me, I haven't checked the math, but they said I think 20% of the world's population is in the Indus and Ganges River valleys. And so think of the impact with we saw in Pakistan flood, 20 million people homeless. So how, to me, the important question is, in addition to how do we respond, how do we prepare, how do we mitigate the risk? And there are all sorts of academic studies which show the return on investment from disaster risk reduction is anywhere between four to eight to one, four dollars return for a dollar invested. And to echo what Mark's point about congressional appropriations for disaster risk reduction, American Red Cross, we rely on public donations. And when there's a high profile disaster like Haiti or the tsunami, we don't fundraise, we fund catch. The money comes pouring in from generous Americans. But I've got to work 30 times harder to raise a dollar for disaster risk reduction. It's a great business case, but it doesn't have the emotional appeal. You know, I can bring a donor, corporate, individual, foundation, and show a community in Indonesia um, doing a mock disaster drill. And that's great. It prepares them. We can take them to Vietnam and show them how the community can read the Mekong River and understand when it's about to overflow its banks and what to do. Or I can take them to Haiti and show them how we have marked out hurricane evacuation routes and developed a really low-tech early warning system to get to the 1.3 million now, maybe 800,000 people who are homeless. That is a great return on investment. It's just not, unfortunately, sexy. Now, we have seen the U.S. government fund some of our programs. We've seen corporate America fund some of our disaster risk reduction programs. And to me, that's a priority. Um, when there's a high-profile disaster, the money will come. Americans are extremely generous. It's during those quiet periods when you're preparing for a disaster that I think, you know, the, the, the investment needs to be made. So just some general observations and look forward to your, your questions. Well, I'll obviously echo the thanks of my colleagues, Rick, to CSIS and to LSU and Pennington Foundation. I, I am really impressed that we can get a standing room only crowd at <laughs> five o'clock on a normal Monday in January for such a topic. So we kudos to the audience and CSIS for, you know, doing the outreach and, and organizing this. Um, you know, the, the premise of the discussion that we were given is there's a humanitarian surge, that there's increasing interest in humanitarian response, there are non-traditional -trad actors and and so on, and I'm gonna push back a little bit on that. I mean, there, one of the problems in our community is we do tend to overreact to the most recent case. Yes, Haiti, everyone showed up in Haiti, but did everyone show up in Pakistan? Absolutely not. Let's not even talk Pakistan, let's talk Somalia. 3.5 million people are facing an immense food crisis in Somalia in the midst of war, even as we speak. I don't even see Sean Penn going to Somalia. 
um, in Thailand during post tsunami, yes, humanitarian surge, helped by you know Thai food and and Thai beaches, in northern Sri Lanka, post tsunami, very thin on the ground was the humanitarian community, much less these non-traditional actors. So one of the issues remains this whole question of equitable response, response commensurate with need, in places where access is difficult, where there's little public attention. I mean, the basic injustice in the humanitarian system remains. And I think we have to make sure that we continue to focus on that and not be overly concerned about the fact that you know, everyone and her brother was heading down to, to Haiti. It's a, it's a special case, it's a special moment. Yes, it was chaotic, but again, let's not, let's not overreact to that. Now, having said that, I will confess, it's very depressing to be a 30-year member of a profession that basically anyone thinks she or he can do. I mean, you know, Soldiers, ministers, firemen, actors, high school students, I mean, everyone is ready to sign up for the humanitarian venture. And it just, really? I mean, and it, it's almost like, in, in fact, there's almost this sense that, you know, if you're a professional in this field, it's somehow you've kind of sold out or you've lost the kind of heart and soul of, um, that may have motivated us in the, in the first place. What, what I'm interested in is, I mean, Mark, I want to, I mean, yes, let's expand the capacity, but let's expand the capacity through professional organizations. What I'm interested in is, sure, let's talk partnership, but let's talk partnership in terms of support for individuals and institutions that actually have expertise in humanitarian response. I'm not really, frankly, personally, and I think I will stress that I'm speaking for myself here, I'm really not that interested in facilitating the access of many people who have no experience in this area just to increase the capacity. Let's get funding for what we do, what we know how to do. That's what I'm interested in. <coughs> now, the challenge, I think, for our community, in some ways, is to demonstrate impact and show that we really are effective. I mean, I can't turn to a foundation or to a potential corporate sponsor or something and you know, say, just give us money because you know we're good. I mean, we have to do a better job in our community of documenting impact, of being transparent about the funding that we, that we receive. I think that's one thing that's fundamental. We have to do a better job. I mean, the reason everyone thinks they can do this work is that we don't do a very good job in our community of, of, a, of communicating what our, what our standards are. How many people in this room are familiar with the SPHERE standards? Okay, decent percentage, probably more than half. But I mean, the point is, I think virtually no one outside our community knows that we have, over the last 15 or 20 years, developed professional standards in all the technical areas that we engage in whether it's water and sanitation or, or food distribution, we're adding protection this time to the, to the new sphere guide. Interaction has its own member standards. So we need to do a better job of, you know, kind of making people familiar that this is a community that does, among its most responsible members, try to abide by the rules. One of the things that we've talked about in, as a result of Haiti, when you did have so many untraditional actors, is thinking about perhaps a, a threshold for participation in the, formal, in the formal coordination mechanisms. So 
instead of having 400 organizations in a meeting of the health, health cluster, can you find a way to define who needs to be around the table, who has the capacity to actually deliver assistance? Because those are the people that you want in the meeting. Those are the people that you want to be part of a, an effort at, uh, at coordination. And you know, this Republic of NGO thing, I mean, one of the messages that Interaction developed in the context of the one-year anniversary was that from a U.S. perspective, 90% of the private assistance was delivered by 10 to 15 organizations. So let's not, again, let's not overreact to Haiti. The bottom line is there are about 15 organizations that matter, and those organizations need to make sure that they're collaborating, cooperating, living up to community standards, and so on. Because if a SAVE or a World Vision or a Mercy Corps or an American Red Cross, if our community fundamentally is ineffective, that's the problem that we should be, um, that we, we should be focusing on. And I think we would be remiss if we don't uh, think a little bit about the donors and their role, the government agencies that, that give to these efforts. And you know, we need, from an NGO perspective, I, I know this is a tough one, but greater flexibility in the funding. We need adherence. The US was a leader in developing the good humanitarian donorship principles. Are we living up to those principles? I mean, the whole, the whole premise of good humanitarian donorship is that you leave political criteria aside, you focus on where the need is, and you provide aid based on need. Is that really feasible in the context of the war on terror? I'd, I'd say our, our success as a US government in living up to those principles is, is mixed at, at best. So I'm, that would be kind of the agenda that, that I would lay out. The one area that hasn't come up yet in terms of expanding our community is the humanitarian enterprise, unfortunately, right now, is seen as and is often, in fact, a Western enterprise, a Northern enterprise, one that's driven by the US, the Scandinavians, the EU, and so on. A lot of the response in Pakistan was from the Gulf states, from, from Saudi Arabia, from Islamic charities, and there has to be a dialogue between these communities if we're going to, be, if, if we're going to maintain humanitarian values as, as universal. So I think, I mean, a thousand flowers are going to continue to bloom. I mean, that, that's the way I look at it. But again, they're not going to bloom in, in Somalia. Um, you know, they're going to bloom in, in places like Haiti. And I think it's fundamentally, the fundamental challenge is increasing our professionalism and effectiveness, and then using that as a case to build the partnerships that are needed to expand our capacity. Thank you. Wow, that, those were great. Let's give our uh, panelists a round of applause real quick. Okay. Um, wow. I did, I, I, thank you all for those, those were wonderful remarks. I learned a lot. I, I do can't believe we have standing room only. We brought in a bunch of extra chairs. So thank you all for coming. I'm overwhelmed by the, uh, by the uh, attendance here. And thanks again to Stacy and Mark and everyone for getting folks here. Who wants to start off with the first question? I have a couple but I'll let you guys go first. Um, please state your name, the gentleman in the blue suit right here, and your organization. And we have a microphone, so if you could just wait um, to there. And also in your question, if you don't mind um, picking one of the panelists to, to, to address your question, or maybe multiple ones, just let us know who you want to answer it. Thank you. Okay, and thank you. Um, my name is Clyde Paris. I'm from the Embassy of Barbados. Um, I found the, thought, the thoughts expressed by Mr. Charney very, very sobering, and um, I think uh, uh, perspective that we really need to pay a lot of attention to, and especially in, in today's world with the, the whole question of um, the, the, the confusion and so on that we've had in, in the Haiti situation. But I wanted to ask, um, in terms of international cooperation, when we go back to previous examples, um, I, I wonder what lessons we have uh, been able to learn from any previous examples. I mean, we, there's so many of, of these situations have been going on around the world. And, and so the Haiti situation, 
Uh, obviously, in the in the in the initial stages, yes, there's a lot of, of um, you know fog and so on. But what have we really learned? Uh, what lessons have we learned from the previous um, international uh, situations? And then a question that always came to my mind is uh, the, again alluded to by Mr. Mr. Charney there, the NGO, the volume or the, the I mean in Haiti, for example, we are told that there are 10,000 NGOs operating in Haiti. Uh, what um, have we seen as the the benefit? Uh, over the time that there have been there, either before or even after the after the, uh, the 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 earthquake situation, and what therefore do we think is the future with respect to um, when we look at the volume of uh, or the number of NGOs in a place like Haiti, and how does that compare to any other uh, part of the world? And I, I think well, the question was answered by Mr. Charney already. The fact that in other other um, similar situations, there's not that um, desire. Uh, for NGOs to get to those locations. So I'm very interesting to, interested to understand um, you know, how the dynamics play out here in this particular situation. Thank you. Joel, you got the easy question first. Hi. Okay, well, uh, settle, settle back. Um, uh, and David and Mark, please. Uh, lessons learned. Um, I, I think one fundamental one is, is precisely that we need to be more humble and that the life-saving activity is often, if not always, done in the first instance by local people. I mean, when the, when the tsunami hit Sri Lanka, the lives were saved to the extent that they were by, by villagers, by local governments, and then you know the aid agents. The aid agencies ramp up and and come in and you know try again. It, it's it's all done out of out of goodwill and a and a need to help. But this this whole pre, I mean one aspect of prevention is you know supporting local people in their ability to be resilient and and respond to um, to what's needed in a in a given situation. I, I mean I think that's. That's a very important uh, lesson among many that could be that could be cited. You know, NGOs are an aspect of, of civil society, and we want vibrant civil societies that have organizations that express, you know, community will that meet community needs and and so on. NGOs cannot solve all the problems of a, of a country. You need the government, you need the private sector, and you know, it, it, you know it, it, in other words, it's not, Haiti is not poor because there are 10,000 NGOs. I mean, Haiti is poor because of all, I mean, we can have this, the Haiti seminar, that, that can be tomorrow. But, you know, I, I mean, I think it's totally unfair to say the reason people are poor in Haiti is because there are 10,000 NGOs. I mean, to, to a large extent, NGOs are, are trying to deal with problems and represent a, a legitimate response to, to, what the, to what the needs are. And you know, I, I point to a place like, I mean, there are places where NGOs do absolutely phenomenal, do transformational things, like in India. You take an NGO like the Self-Employed Women's Association that's organized tens of thousands of women and fought for better wages, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you know, that's, that's a development context where organizing local people through NGO action has, has brought real change. Bangladesh and the Philippines would be other places that I've, I, I would cite where NGOs have made a real difference. David? Just a um, couple of points, one on, on lessons learned, and um, you've heard mention of cluster leads or cluster, the UN cluster system. And for those of you who are not um, international disaster uh, experts, uh, a number of years ago, uh, to address that issue of coordination, uh, the UN with others developed the cluster system. And essentially, um, each sector, call it health, or maybe it's shelter um, or protection, has an organization that leads the relief effort. So in food, it's the World Food Program. They're the quarterback. They don't run all of food relief following a disaster, but they are the quarterback. They convene the meetings to coordinate. And the cluster system is not perfect. 
It's labor intensive. It can be really painful and messy. But I think a lesson learned from earlier disasters is the need for someone to play quarterback. So there are agencies, often UN but not exclusively, that step forward and the international community recognizes World Food Program, you're the quarterback for food. World Health Organization, you're the quarterback for health, and so on and so forth. So that is, to me, a positive lesson that has been learned. Um, in terms of benefits of NGOs, um, you heard a few examples. I would also say in its early days, but I think the relief and recovery effort following the tsunami uh, was very successful. Um, we can point to homes. We can point to improve water, improve sanitation, improve livelihoods, and say that has gone reasonably well. The, the challenge for NGOs, and I'll just use mine for example, uh, the Red Cross today is providing clean, drinkable water to about 300,000 people every day in Port-au-Prince. And this is a country that before the quake, fewer than a third had access to clean water. What happens when the money runs out? And the Red Cross water <coughs> trucks are idled. Will someone, hopefully the municipal water authority in Port-au-Prince, Dinepa, will they have the capacity to step up and backfill those very large shoes what is difficult for an NGO is balancing the need, balancing the desire to fulfill a humanitarian need, a desperate need, at the same time preparing your exit and knowing that if you have the resources, you cannot in good conscience just leave people by the, by the wayside, thirsty or hungry. So the challenge for us is not only to provide the assistance, but build that um, roadmap to transition that to someone else in a sustainable manner. Um, we can't, in good conscience, hand it off to someone if they're not going to be able to continue to provide that water. But we have to find a way. Thanks. I love a question that allows me to make my point again. Um, <laughs> so thank you. What, what have we learned? What we've learned is we're going we're gonna to fail if we focus on the response. We've got to start investing in activities between the disasters to mitigate the disaster. And I'll give you a couple of great examples that I've seen in person. Cyclone Cedar hit Bangladesh in the early 90s. No, that Cyclone, I don't remember what that one was called. A, a cyclone hit Bangladesh in the early 90s and killed almost 100,000 people. We spent pennies on earthen dams and planting mangrove trees in the Delta. Cyclone Cedar hit a few years ago. And we lost 10,000 people. And I visited after the cyclone. And I saw those earthen dams. And they looked awful. And I saw those mangrove trees. And they looked awful. Why did they look bad? Because they did their job. They held back the water. And the communities were basically OK. And those communities knew how to maintain those walls. And they knew how to take care and plant those trees. Those pennies saved probably, of course we'll never know, probably tens of thousands of lives. Every once in a while the United States government gets something right. As in, it happened in Pakistan. A few years ago we invested in something called the Disease Early Warning System with WHO very simple system for identifying the first signs of a serious infectious disease. Guess when that kicked in during the floods? And we use the disease early warning system to tell us where the isolated, isolated cases of cholera were showing up. And we zapped them. And it didn't spread. Pennies invested in dues saved us potentially a public health calamity on top of the floods. So what lesson has my office learned? Those pennies invested, and maybe we could get it into tens and twenties, um, in, in risk reduction activities between the disasters will really pay off because we can't win if we focus entirely on response. Thank you. Next question over here on the right.
Housing. Bob Tuey, uh, Homeland Security Institute. Mr. Ward, you suggested and or posited that we need to have an international response framework, and you said AID would be willing to participate. But who, in your mind, should lead that? What organization should lead the development of an of an international response framework? Thanks, Bob. Depends on the disaster. Um, I mean, I can't presage what we will come up with. It'll be an interagency effort to develop what that fr framework is. But I think um, what I expect will happen is that there will be a process in place for depending on the disaster and the complexity of it and where it is and the security situation in that country um, and the resources that have to be brought to bear, um, some senior official in our government um, will decide. You know, the state's going to take the lead on this one. Maybe USAID's going to take the lead on this one. Maybe the NSC, if it's a truly whole of government effort and you really need a strong coordinating mechanism, will take the lead on this one. I don't think, I may be wrong, I don't think that when we develop this international response framework, it will say, unlike the national response framework, that this agency is always in charge or this department is always in charge. I may be wrong. It may come out that way, like FEMA is always in the lead for the national disasters, uh, the domestic disasters. But that's my expectation, is that it will, it will define a process that will quickly identify who is in charge, but it will not say it's always this organization. And that would be progress. Um, we're happy to lead it, but I think everybody in the interagency has to depart, has to participate, including you, you know, Homeland Security, absolutely. Um, and we have a lot of lessons to learn from FEMA, so I hope they're with us there too. I'm gonna stay away from that one, huh? Um, anybody from this side of the room? I like to mix it up. Left side is just a little slow tonight. Okay, back to the middle, uh, and the, the Navy guy. Uh, Bruno Himmler, I work for Public Health Service, uh, ASPR within Department of Health and Human Services. Quick question first to Joel and David. Uh, the media has been kind of critical of our international response in Haiti one year afterwards, but given the status of what Haiti was beforehand, the difficulties they had in trying to develop their capacity over the several years, is things as bad as the media portrays or is this what is to be expected if we're trying to help rebuild a government at the same time. And then my second question to Mark is to say, when we try to do it by, through, and with the host nation, but if the government lacks the capability or we hear about the issues of corruption that will oftentimes interfere with the development happening, um, are we setting ourselves up for failure by trying to do it through the local government or through a government that's not capable of helping us achieve our objectives? And would it be better to look at just doing it at the local level versus trying to go through a national government? Go ahead. Who's first? <laughs> on, um, on Haiti, um, my, my feeling is that the relief effort was remarkable given the obstacles. And basically, 1.3 million people have been provided with 